The scripture reading today is from the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Although St. Paul is sometimes um, considered to sound a little harsh and exclusive in the way he understands the faith, it is clear that he had a very broad and beautiful understanding of what God was accomplishing in the world. The lines that we hear today show Paul's inclusive vision of what God is ultimately doing in creation. Paul writes, For all of creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that all of creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that all of creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Amen. Bom dia. So, good morning. The... uh, Sisters and brothers, it is a, a pleasure to stay with you today as a good day moment as well. And uh, I thank you so much for all the warm environment you had offered during my days in Chicago. I'm pleased to stand before the Union Church of Hinsdale and before friends online today, and celebrate together the Feast of Pentecost. I will not thank thank you as individuals, but thank you all, as we will keep on united, even far away from Africa, as the good ties were developed among us. According to Christian tradition, it is the celebration, Pentecost is the celebration of the birth of the church. On this day, the Spirit of God was poured out on all flesh. The concept of God's Spirit being present in all has been clear as I have interacted with different cultures. My current journey in the USA has given me new and different experiences in how to understand the meaning of the three-letter word, all. One day, about two months ago, when I was walking from our home in Lagrange Park to Hinsdale, I was surprised by a voice from a car which came behind me. May I speak with you? I replied, yes, please. It was a police officer. I stopped and he came out from his car in my direction. Hi, how is the weather today? I responded to him, it is nice. And I wish Chicago's weather were like this every day. He asked me, where are you going? I replied, he is there. Actually, I learned now to say, he. I used to say, he is there. (laughs) My friend taught me. He made his face looking strange. He is there. Where do you live? On a Kensington Avenue, I replied. Do you have an ID for me, please? 
While we were talking, suddenly a second police car arrived. The new police asked as well how I was doing, and uh, he asked where I was going and if I was enjoying the day. The second officer left just after greeting me and wishing me a nice walk. The first officer took notes of my name, address, and reported me that I am talking with you because somebody called us and he said you were seen in somebody's yard. I responded, when? He said, today. I explained, as far as I am aware, I am walking only on sidewalks and on streets. While the officers were friendly, something keeps telling me that the person who called the police may have acted out of racial prejudice. Could not a white family have a black or yellow, a red or a brown African friend? At a certain moment, I felt bad for the person who called but of course, in their self-understanding, the person who called the police station may have done it with the altruistic motivation of protecting my friend's property where they first saw me. Due to the evil that surrounds us, even good intentions end up becoming questionable. The unanswered question that will remain with me is, would the person have called the police if I were not a black person? I am aware that I am describing a small incident between us as human beings. However, we all have committed worse offenses against the other parts of God's creation on earth. We have displaced non-human species without caring for their rights on the planet. We exploited the earth's resources in a way like humans were the only ones who deserve. There has been an emphasis on the central place of human beings in the earth, but almost nothing is in regard to the non-human beings. When we hear that God's spirit was poured out on all flesh, we need to stand with these voiceless siblings and say, all means all. In Christian theology, it has long been said that pantheism is not a good doctrine. Pantheism is when all things are considered to be good. But I have learned a different concept that sounds similar, but I believe is good and healthy Christian theology. It is Panentheism. Panentheism does not say all is God, but that God is in all things. They are part of God's beloved creation. God is in all and above all. Panentheism is in, agree is in agreement with Genesis chapter 2. God created human beings and all other living beings from a fertile soil. Etymologically, this word comes from a Greek where pan stands for all, n means in, 
and theism stands for theos, God. In this view, creation, earth, all things should be honored. Like to say, material meras. At the beginning of the Bible, there are two stories of creation. Often we treat them as one story. But Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 were really written by different people at different times for different reasons. The story in Genesis 1 is more familiar, where humans appear as the last creation created by God. The pinnacle, the pinnacle of a creation who just come into being by the word of God. But in Genesis 2, humans appear as having been created before animals and are made from the earth, the soil. At some time in history, perhaps because it confirmed their strength that they were superior, people came to emphasize the first story more especially, Genesis 1, 27, which reads, so God created man, which is humankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This overemphasis on this verse made the human beings claim the right of hegemony over their fellow creatures. To make things worse, the same passage added to humankind the role of subduing the earth by saying that, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have a dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon earth. How powerful the human species is. I have learned that people often misunderstand the word dominion in a way that makes it more like dominate, control, or even do with as you please. But in Hebrew, to have dominion is not to dominate, but to care for something, to take resp responsibility for something. Also, whatever it means to be created in the image of God, it clearly doesn't mean that we can dominate and abuse other things. God is love. So, so we are created in the image of love. And if we are created in the image of love, it doesn't mean that everything we do is, the, is in the image of God. Our history is not suitable to be called the image of God. All one needs is to look at the killing of innocent children and the killing of other humans and non-human beings. Would the likeness of God perpetrate World War I, World War II, and the current wars the world faces? with the superiority of humanity being emphasized at the expense of humanity's intimate connection to creation, the liturgical celebration of Pentecost is a call to reconciliation with the creation. As we know, sisters and brothers, reconciliation is a way of restoration of friendly relations among people. 
my country, Angola, used to say repeatedly, why continue our civil war if we are all Angolans? Why nourish enmity between South Africans and Angolans if we are all Southern Africans? And broadly speaking, we are all, we are all Africans. The list of the commonalities could go on. From where I speak now, one would ask, why are there divisions and increasing hatred if you are all from the global north? And of course, we are all Christians, no matter our country. And all of us are human. There is just one human family. In these attempts of reconciliation, we often commit the mistake of exclusivism, borrowing American vocabulary, my fifth language. We Africans may be proud and say our dream is to mega, make Africa great again. As all the humans may have spread from Africa to all over the world. American citizens may claim they are proud of being part of the source of democracy, freedom, and science. People may claim other big achievements they are proud of. Our Bible passage, read by, not Nancy, my friend, brings us an awareness that salvation is not only human beings' dreams. All of the creation is embraced by the love of God. The fight for freedom should encompass all the fellow beings and not only certain political parties, nations, or even species. The Pentecost is a feast of the Holy Spirit coming to mix the people who were gathered in Jerusalem, as Mike read a few minutes ago. People of different languages Continents, races, social status, religion, cultures, and traditions were together, and God poured the Holy Spirit on them, and they joined in the mission to witness the name of Jesus. We should recall here that the same Spirit poured to humans, according to Genesis, was as well one poured by God to all other living beings. Animals and humans share the same breath, and God, the same breath of God, and it, this implies each one of us to be responsible for the well-being of a human and non-human beings. Both animals and human beings were created from the same fertile soil and breathing the same hair. For Genesis 2 implies a kinship of all creation. From this end, the fight for liberation must always be inclusive and not exclusive. To embrace this journey, we need to start by changing the relationships in our own species of humans. And in this view, African-American theologian James Cone warns that people who fight against white racism but fail to connect it to the biodegradation of the earth are anti-ecological whether they know it or not. People who struggle against environmental degradation 
but do not fight against white supremacy are racists, whether they acknowledge it or not. The fight for justice cannot be segregated, but must be integrated with the fight for life in all its forms. It is important to protect whales, giraffes, birds, the giant sable antelope, the endangered national symbol of my country, Angola, the plant and the bees, you name it, but it is a must to protect people from our own species as well. In the same way, it is important to fight against the racism and the other forms of human to human domination. But we have to fight for liberation of other marginalized species as well. One of the most important concepts I learned in my interactions with other peoples is the ahimsa, ahimsa. This word derives from Asian religious traditions of Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism that teaches not to cause injury to another living being. Like agape, which is love, taught by Jesus, ahimsa and agape overlap. The same is true with the concept of interbeing introduced by a Vietnamese monk called Chik Nhat Ha. Interbeing instructs human beings that what is known as an individual does not really exist. According to this Buddhist teaching, I am, therefore, you are. We inter are. Each one of us is a consequence of others. This understanding is known as the notion of non-duality. In other words, there is not a single thing that exists apart from other things. If we are inter-beings, whatever affects one affects all. Many of the world leaders whose deeds we celebrate these days had a direct or indirect encounters of this Buddhist reality. Martin Luther King expressed this view to America and the world, warning that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This understanding of ahimsa or interbeing is found in many of the world's heroes. Mahatma Gandhi in India, Martin Luther King and Dorothy Day in the USA, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, and the others elsewhere in the world. All of these people were aware that all things are connected, and the all means all. Let me close with a constructive example of a true, of a true inclusive humanity. After his inauguration as the president of South Africa, after facing 27 years in prisons, Nelson Mandela proclaimed a nation for all. This is an amazing teaching of Mandela, who was, of course, imprisoned for his peaceful resistance to the racist white apartheid government. He spent 18 years in a seven by nine foot concrete cell where a bulb burned day and night over his head. When apartheid was overcome and he was released, he was asked why he should share the country equally 
with members of the former apartheid regime. Mandela simply replied, they were all humans. In his words, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. He added, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I did not leave bitterness and the hatred behind, I would still in prison. All means all. If we mistreat other beings or other people, we mistreat ourselves as we are all inter beings. May God help us to maintain love and the peace with all, all humans and the all creation. Amen.